Okay, welcome to everyone. Um, today we have the talk by Stella Sia on collision and quantum thermometry. I'm going to make the chairperson here. Uh, as indicated in the chat, uh, uh, please uh, switch off your videos and microphones during the talk. For the Q&A later, uh, we'll see how, how we do it. You can certainly uh, either unmute yourself and ask your question or else uh, uh, put the question in the chat and then uh, I will bring it up. So uh, now I leave the floor to Stella. Uh, please, Stella, you can start. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the talk today. So um, today I'll be talking about collisional quantum thermometry, um, where I'll be introducing the use of collision models as a way for um, measuring temperature. So um, this talk will be based on two papers, actually. One, one was a PRL paper that was published last year, and the other paper um, is a recent paper that was posted on archive um, a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so before I start, uh, let me briefly introduce Fisher information as a common figure of merit for parameter estimation. So here, um, the Fisher information is a way of quantifying the amount of information that an observable random variable described by the distribution P of X um, carries about an unknown parameter X. So it is computed by a weighted sum of sensitivities um, of the probability um, to the parameter change. So over here, you can see that um, here you consider the uh, derivative with respect to X of ln of PX, where PX is the probability um, um, of the distribution. So the Kramer round bound then relates the Fisher information to the square of the uncertainty of the parameter x, where the reciprocal of the Fisher information would set the lower bound on the square of the uncertainty. So uh, basically, this means that the more the higher the Fisher information, the lower the uncertainty in determining x. Um, however, here, um, note that the actual uncertainty would actually depend on the choice of the esti estimator used uh, to determine the value of x. So over here for the rest of the talk, uh, I will not discuss the choice of the estimator, but rather I'll use uh, Fisher information as, the, as a quantifier for um, the metrology protocol. Okay, so um, what is quantum Fisher information? So quantum Fisher information is simply um, the maximum Fisher information one can obtain uh, for from a given quantum state. So this basically means that uh, for a state, uh, for a given state, we know that we can apply a set, uh, a different sets of POVMs on the state. So the POVM uh, pi x that generates a distribution P of x such that it maximizes the Fisher information. This Fisher information is known as the quantum Fisher information. Okay, so now let me introduce the use of collision models uh, as a metrology tool. So in collision models, uh, we typically consider a stream of probes or oscillators that actually comes in to interact sequentially with uh, the system. So for instance here, uh, if, the, um, if the probes, the green ones, if they are thermal probes, then you can actually, uh, an energy exchange between the system and the probes can actually mimic a thermalization process, for instance. Okay. Here instead, uh, what we do is we can actually perceive these oscillators as um, probes that actually indirectly measure some system parameter x. So after each interaction uh, with the system, the oscillator actually carries away some information of x. And um, by measuring um, by measuring this um, oscillators with a suitable POVM pi, we can actually obtain information about x. And um, with sufficient measurements um, of the oscillators, we should be able to obtain um, a higher precision um, of this parameter x that we are trying to determine. And possible advantages could actually arise from collective measurements of multiple oscillators. So instead of applying a POVM that acts on a single oscillator, this POVM can act on um, two or three oscillators, and this could actually give us a collective advantage. So as a preliminary study here, uh, I shall now focus on the use of such a model in determining the temperature of the environment. Okay. So here, um, the system will now serve as an intermediary of the environment um, at temperature T, through which the oscillators actually learn about the environment. So after each SA interaction described by um, a unitary U of SA, the oscillator will actually carry away some information about the temperature T. And between successive um, 
uh, between intervals of successive SA interactions, the system would then undergo relaxation with the environment. Um, and this will be described by a thermal map ES. And this system will now gain uh, additional information about T. And subsequently, um, for the next SA interaction, the system will now transfer this information about T back to the oscillator. And this means that after sufficient measurements of the oscillators, we should be able to gain more information about the temperature. Okay, so this is a circuit representation of what I have just described, where we have alternating uh, USA strokes as well as the thermal strokes uh, described by the map E of S. So over here, um, the SA interaction is characterized by the product of the interaction strength G as well as the interaction duration tau SA. So likewise, in a similar fashion, uh, the thermal map itself would depend on the system environment coupling gamma as well as the thermalization time tau SE. Okay. So the system and the oscillators will actually evolve uh, stroboscopically in a sequence of pairwise SA interactions followed by the application of a thermal map. So over here, we see that uh, for the system would actually be coupled to the oscillator first, um, and you apply a unitary um, that acts on the system and oscillator, followed by a thermal map, and then you will trace out the oscillator. Okay. And um, the system will eventually reach a stroboscopic steady state, rho s star, which is given by uh, the fixed point of this map as shown. So once we actually reach this steady operation where the state is now in uh, rho s star, the outgoing oscillators will actually be translationally invariant, which means that uh, the measurement, the, the Fisher information will actually be the same for any measurements of any n successive oscillators. So one can then consider POVMs on say like one oscillator as shown here, or perhaps two oscillators for instance. So for the rest of the talk, um, I'll use the notation f of n to represent the Fisher information obtained from collective measurements of n oscillators, uh, n oscillators at the output. Okay, so to assess whether um, our thermometry protocol is actually better than a standard thermometer, let us first consider what we uh, what's the Fisher information that we will get for a regular thermometer coupled to an environment of temperature T. Okay, so we know that um, if given sufficient time for this thermometer to equilibrate, the thermometer would actually eventually reach a thermal state uh, with a distribution given by the Boltzmann's distribution, uh, which depends on the energy spectrum of the thermometer itself. Okay, and from this distribution, we can actually compute the thermal Fisher information, which would then give the kramer rao bound as given here, where the temperature uncertainty is actually bounded by the reciprocal of the specific heat capacity C. So it would, be, it would be reasonable then to compare the Fisher information obtained from uh, our thermometry protocol with the thermal Fisher information, which would basically tell us how much information we can obtain uh, from a single oscillator as compared to a standard thermometer equilibrated to the thermal state. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, um, I will consider a minimal model with just qubits, where I assume that the system and oscillators are actually qubits of resonance with frequency big omega here. And in this case, uh, the thermal Fisher information would be given by the expression as shown here, where n bar over here is the mean bath occupation number evaluated at frequency big omega at temperature T. So let us first consider a measurement interaction where USA is generated by a Hamilton uh, uh, ZZ interaction of this form. Okay, and uh, the good thing about this interaction is that since the interaction is diagonal in the Z basis, the stroboscopic steady state rho S star will, really, will just be a thermal state regardless of the choice of the oscillator. And this interaction is essentially an indirect measurement of uh, the ground and excited states of the system. So as we can see from the uh, sketch here, so if the system is in a ground state, this Hamilt uh, what this Hamiltonian does is that it will rotate the oscillator uh, clockwise by angle G tau. And if the system is in an excited state, it gets rotated the same angle theta, which is equal to G tau, but in the counterclockwise direction. So this actually means that, uh, th so this is like an indirect measurement of the ground and excited state. 
Okay, so um, in this case, the optimum state will really, the optimum choice of an oscillator will really just be an uh, plus state, any plus state on the xy plane, so that um, after the interaction, we actually get maximum distinguishability from the interaction itself. Okay, so assuming the incoming oscillator state is prepared in a plus x state, for instance, so um, in the optimum case where g tau, where the angle theta is 90 degrees, then the final um, oscillator that actually comes out will really just be a thermal mixture of plus y and minus y, and then we will obtain the thermal fissure information. Okay, and since this interaction is essentially an indirect measurement, process, it should be intuitively clear that we can never obtain from a single measurement more information than the information contained in a thermal qubit. And the fissure information would indeed depend on the measurement strength described by g tau. So over here, you see from this expression that a uh, measurement of a single oscillator can never beat the thermal fissure information. And uh, it depends on the interaction strength g tau. So now let's consider the case where we have an ideal measurement, meaning um, g tau is pi over 2, such that uh, the state of the oscillators can be distinguished perfectly. Okay. So in the case where gamma tau actually approaches infinity, this actually means that the system will always be reset back to a thermal mixture after each SE uh, -E interaction. So this actually means that the system will always be, in, uh, will always be found a uh, in the ground state with a probability of pg and the oscillators will then interact with a fresh thermal qubit each time it uh, each time it sees the system and measurement of an oscillator would then be like an independent measurement of a thermal state so each of them will be in a thermal state which means that we should not expect any advantage that comes from collectively measuring n oscillators so the fissure information of n oscillators will simply be n times the thermal fissure information. However, um, if the system environment parameter is small, so if gamma tau goes to ze approaches zero, it actually means that the system is essentially decoupled from the environment and the system is evolving uni almost unitarily. So this means that if the system is initially in a thermal state, it will be in either a in the ground state or in the excited state. And this actually means that the incoming oscillators will always see the same state. So in this case, uh, the outgoing oscillators will either be all plus y or all minus y, depending on whether the state is in G or E. And this means that uh, if you compute the fissure information, the fissure information will always just be the thermal fissure information, regardless of the number of oscillators you use. Okay, so in fact, uh, this ZZ interaction is nice in the sense that it generates a classical probability that can be represented nicely with a probability tree diagram since the outgoing oscillators are always diagonal in the Y basis. So the optimum POVM in this case is uh, simply the projectors in, this, in the Y basis. Okay, and it becomes clear from this probability tree that uh, we can gain information not just through the probabilities of ground and excited states itself, but also through the transition probabilities uh, on, uh, depending on whether the state is in G or E. Okay, so over here, um, this uh, I just wrote down the G, uh, the transition probabilities from G to G and from E to G, and we see that it depends on this uh, parameter big gamma here which is actually just a uh, small gamma tau multiplied by 2m bar plus 1. And from this big gamma, we can actually assess information about the temperature through the m bar dependence. So in fact, uh, we can actually show that the fissure information um, obtained from measuring n oscillators is actually, um, can actually be described by an arithmetic progression with the initial fissure information described by the thermal fissure information and subsequent fissure information increase uh, given by this delta term here, which encodes the um, information about the transition probabilities. So over here from this expression, we actually see that um, if we want the fissure information to beat the thermal fissure information, then uh, we just need uh, delta to be greater than the FTH. So in fact, uh, if we actually do a contour plot of delta 
for different um, temperatures or MBAS and different uh, gamma tau, we actually see that there, are, there is indeed a region. Okay, so within the shaded region, you actually get delta more than um, the thermal fissure information. And over here, um, we notice that the delta can actually reach close to 100 times the thermal fissure information, especially in the high temperature limit. So the reason for this enhancement is because in the high temperature limit, um, both the excited and the ground probabilities actually saturate to half, which means that you don't really gain information from the probabilities of the ground and excited states themselves. But um, the oscillators can then gain information about the temperature through the temperature dependent decay rate big gamma by looking at whether a jump occurs between successive uh, oscillators. So this is where the information comes from and this actually gives us uh, an enhancement at high temperature. So to summarize, um, we see that for this kind of ZZ interaction, it is actually a very intuitive choice of a measurement process and we actually know the optimum choice of oscillator that we should use as well as the POVMs that we should um, apply on the output. And we can actually, and this ZZ interaction is good because the steady state is really just um, the thermal state, which means that if we already have a system that is initially in thermal equilibrium with the environment, then we can actually perform on the fly um, temperature estimation without having to wait for steady state operation. Okay. And also here we see that uh, we can indeed beat the thermal fissure information if we look at collective um, measurements for uh, within certain regimes, especially at the high temperature limit. However, the disadvantage of this um, protocol is that the fissure information of a single oscillator can never beat the thermal fissure information, since we are doing a measurement of the of a thermal state. And in addition, um, this enhancement from the collective measurement is not always guaranteed, and it would depend on the value delta. So now let us consider um, a different kind of interaction. So let's consider an energy exchange channel uh, generated by an interaction like this. Okay, so you have a typical exchange interaction between um, the, uh, the system and the auxiliar. And in this case, uh, this interaction would serve as an additional incoherent energy exchange channel that would actually drive the system uh, to a state that is out of thermal equilibrium. So over here, um, after each um, SA interaction, the system is put up to a state rho S prime, where this rho S prime would actually depend on the choice of the auxiliary state. And in this case, since the system, since the rho S prime is out of thermal equilibrium, it means that every application of a thermal map would actually drive the system towards a thermal state. And the rho S star here, would really be a weight, would just be a weighted sum of rho s prime and the thermal state depending on the uh, decay rate gamma. So subsequent SA interaction would then describe the transfer of the information about the temperature from the system back uh, to the oscillators. And this will actually bring the system back to rho s prime. So in other words, the measurement of a single auxiliar is would be like performing an independent measurement of um, the temperature and collective measurements of N auxiliars can only improve the fissure information compared to N measurements of a single auxiliar. So we actually get this, uh, we actually, get, um, we are ensured that there would at least be, um, we, we are ensured that measuring N auxiliars would at least be the same as having um, as measuring an independent on okay. However, over here, since the steady state uh, rho s star is not a thermal state, we are actually not guaranteed to be able to reach the thermal fissure information from a single auxiliar. And additionally, since the system state would actually depend on the auxiliar state, it is not intuitively clear what the optimum state should be, unlike the case of a ZZ interaction where it's clear that we should use a plus state. So in this case, let us explore a few possibilities for such a protocol. So like before, we can always consider collective measurements um, at the output described by a block size n. However, since the initial system state can change the steady state, the fissure information can actually change depending on the choice of auxilla in the Hubert space of B qubits. 
So let us first consider the same case as before. So we, if we have identically prepared oscillators, um, so B equals to one, and we only measure one oscillator. So here we see that an exchange interaction itself is sufficient to, for us to beat the thermal fissure information. So over here within this uh, dotted lines here, you actually see that uh, the fissure information of one oscillator is actually greater than the thermal fissure information. Okay, and this is um as and this enhancement is especially um obvious um at strong coupling, whereas a coherent state. So if we use a plus state, we see that there is this advantage, but uh, it's only a very small region, so it's almost like um non-existent. So if we focus on the limit where we are allowed to do a strong swap, a full swap, so when g tau equals to pi over two, then we actually see that um if we characterize um the on the input on oscillators as a pure state uh, with the polar angle theta from the z-axis then we actually see from the figure on the left that uh, for full swap interactions the optimal state is always approximately the ground state regardless of the temperature or the gamma tau value okay so over here the maximum theta is about 0 0.05 theta uh, is about 0 0.05 pi and the ratio of the optimal um, fissure information um, over the thermal fissure information is plotted on the right here. And we see that we can actually get very, uh, very high um, ratios here uh, that hits about um, close to um, 100 times here um, at the, in the high temperature limit. Okay. So the reason for this uh, is the same as before. So it, at the high temperature limit, uh, your populations, you cannot probe any information from the populations, but you can actually probe the, uh, inf you can actually probe the temperature through the decay rate gamma. So in fact, we saw that um, by using ground state on cellars, it is actually sufficient um, for you to hit this thermal fish, uh, to exceed the thermal fissure information as we can actually hit up to 99.6 times, uh, up to 99.6% um, of the optimum fissure information computed from the optimum state. So the reason for this enhancement actually comes from the fact that the system is driven out of thermal equilibrium to the state at, uh, shown here. So this actually means that uh, we can actually gain information not just through the populations, but also through gamma. Okay, and the choice of and the use of ground states is very good because um, at full swap, this actually means that there is no coherence involved. So um, everything would be diagonal in the z basis, and in this case, the optimum POVM is always just the projectors in the plus and minus z basis. But the problem with uh, full swap is that since there is no coherences, um, there is also no correlation between outgoing oscillator. So each oscillator is actually independent from the other. And this actually means that we will not get any um, enhancement from collective measurements of the oscillators. <laughs> so if we want to see a collective advantage, uh, let us now consider the fissure information computed from measuring two oscillators. And then we now see that um, if we consider this and we optimize over all angles, then the optimum state will no longer be the ground state, but it will actually shift uh, towards a state where the angle where the angle theta is equal to pi over four, uh, depending on gamma tau value and n bar value. So the optimum state would actually now depend on the temperature. So the in the limit of large gamma tau and n bar, the optimum state actually occurs um, at theta equals to pi over four. And the reason for this enhancement is because at large n bar, since we don't really, we cannot really, uh, at large n bar, since we don't, cannot really assess the information um, about the populations, we can, we can only uh, um, assess the temperature through the coherences. So even though the coherences is uh, decaying, it is actually decaying at half the rate of the population decay. So for populations, they decay with a rate big gamma, but over here, the coherences decay with a rate uh, uh, gamma over 2. And also we see that the coherences actually scale with uh, sine 2 theta. So this actually means that um, for theta equals to pi over 2, we actually get the most, the coherences is actually the maximum. And this means that the probes can actually learn the most about the temperature through these coherences. And um, if we compare the enhancement, so if we compare um, F2 over to F1, 
then we see that um, we do get an enhancement from collective measurements uh, where they can actually reach uh, close to 50 times. Okay, so this is a log of F2 over to F1 here. So um, yeah, so we actually do get a collective advantage from using um, from measuring more unseamless. But the problem here is that um, we actually verified numerically that this collective advantage would quickly diminish once we move on to measure a larger number of unseamless, uh, especially for a full swap interaction. So um, however, if we are not able to do uh, full uh, strong interactions, then we can actually exploit this collective advantage at big interactions. Because for big interactions, so if uh, G tau is small, the interaction itself would actually generate coherences between successive ancillas in the GE and EG subspaces. And this will actually correlate them. And this means that um, by construction, if you, do a, if you measure collectively the um, ancillas, you can only perform better than um, doing N independent measurements because you would be able to tap on the information encoded in these coherences. So over here, um, the graph actually shows the collective advantage at um, small SA interactions for different incoming uh, states. So we considered the ground state, the excited state, and the plus state. So the dotted lines here actually mark the point uh, Fn equals to Nf1. So we see that uh, if you look at big interactions, you can actually do much better than um, um, the linear scaling of fissure information. Okay. So um, here what we see is that if we compare these three graphs, um, you actually get the highest enhancement when gamma tau is about 0 0.1. And the reason for this enhancement is because um, the information about temperature is encoded in the rate of decay of the coherences. And at low gamma, we are essentially in the zeno limit where the system state does not really change. And this means that the, gener the coherences generated between successive oscillators will be very small. Okay? And in the high, uh, in, when gamma is large, the coherences will simply decay very quickly. And this means that we, have any, we don't really have much coherences to be begin with, and the enhancement is also lesser. So the optimum regime is really just uh, when gamma tau is, about, is moderately high. So as an example, so if you consider the ground state on Scylla, you can actually show that the ratio of F2 over 2F1 is given by the expression as shown, and we get an additional enhancement from this term, n bar gamma square term. And this term actually peaks um, at 0 0.65 n bar square when big gamma is equal to zero, uh, when big gamma is equal to 1.6. So um, up to this point, um, our protocol actually does not consider initial correlations between the incoming oscillators, and we assume that uh, these oscillators are identically prepared qubits. So now what happens if we move on to um, B equals to 2? So if we allow um, for the oscillators to, to be prepared in block size B equals to 2, then the figure over here actually compares the Fisher information from measuring two output oscillators, depending on whether you prepare them in block size B equals to two or B equals to one. So over here, we see that we do get an enhancement in this case, but it's only a slight improvement. So we only get enhancement of up to 2.5 times. And this is much smaller compared to um, increasing the number of oscillators that you measure. So if you recall, if you go back to the previous slide, then you actually see that if you consider the Fisher information of two oscillators over one oscillator, you actually get up to about 50 times enhancement. Whereas over here, you only get about 2.5 times. So in fact, um, if you look at um, this figure here, we can actually show that we can actually make use of uncorrelated pair of qubit psi that can actually perform up to 90% 90, 90 of the optimal fissure information. And they are specifically just the use of ground state oscillators or the use of uh, or toggling between a plus state and a G state uh, and a ground state. So over here, note that plus G and G plus in our setup is essentially the same thing. So you're sending the same sequence, but it's just that the points um, on which you measure the oscillators will be different. So from this, uh, we actually see that uh, for this, for our protocol at least, 
it is not necessary to consider initial correlations um, such as entanglement because it, that it is not that useful in this case. Okay, so to summarize, we see that um, unlike the ZZ interaction, which does not guarantee a collective advantage from measuring multiple auxilars, an exchange interaction is nice because it always guarantees a, collect, a collective en enhancement. Okay, and for strong uh, system and, uh, and for a strong system auxiliar interaction, a single auxiliar is sufficient to beat the thermal fissure information. And if we are limited by the interaction strength, then one can actually exploit this collective enhancement um, property and get an increase in fissure information. Okay, the disadvantage here is then that since the steady state of the system depends on the incoming state, we would not really know what is the optimum state. And in fact, we actually saw that this optimum state would actually change with temperature. And also um, for ancillas with coherences, um, the optimum POVM may not be obvious or it may not be easy to implement these POVMs. Okay, so to conclude, um, I have introduced the use of collision models as a metrology tool. And as an example, I showed how these collision models can be used to, uh, for a thermometry protocol. And I discussed some strategies um, that can actually help us surpass the thermal fissure information in the strong interaction limit. And also to give collective advantage if we are restricted by the interaction strength. Um, so um, possible outlook for this um, for you, the use of such models is to explore adaptive schemes that can further improve the protocol. So for example, we actually saw that um, the optimum state actually depends on the temperature. So this actually means that uh, we can actually implement this uh, protocol first to get the rough um, temperature range. And once we know the rough temperature range, we can actually know what is the optimum state to use. And this will actually enhance the thermometry process itself. Okay, and that's it. So I've come to the end of the talk. Thanks for listening. Yes. Thank you very much, Stella. Um, I hope uh, people, uh, I'm here in a corner of the building and I had a few uh, uh, problems with the, the, with the audio. In particular, I haven't heard anything of your conclusion. I hope people will had a better experience in other parts of the building. Otherwise, it's, uh, uh, anyway, it's not your fault, of course. Uh, okay. But let's not blame it. Uh, okay, so now it's time for questions. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to either uh, mute themselves and uh, ask a question or they prefer to put it on the chat the Gong Jambin okay Jambin uh, you can ask the question if you want yes uh, can you hear me well yes, yes. okay uh, thanks for excellent talk uh, this is a subject I'm um, also particular interest for him uh, I do have questions, but I don't want to occupy the floor. Okay, so I just uh, first ask a very simple question. Okay, okay, uh, to sort of warm up the audience, can you explain why this? In many occasions, you compare the information you got with the thermal fissure information, but it looks to me this thermal fissure information can be easily broken. You in one case you use one qubit. And because of the excitation, right, you can easily beat that. So I suspect this thermal fish information is not that important because it can be so easily broken. Uh, yes, but then um, over here, I'm just assuming that suppose if you really have a qubit as a thermometer. So naturally, if you want, if you think of what you do with a thermometer, you will put a thermometer with the environment, right? And then at some point, this qubit will actually thermalize with the environment and this actually generates a thermal state which means that if you don't do anything if you don't consider any interactions between the system and environment and just let it naturally thermalize then the fissure information that you get from this system is actually the thermal fissure information so we actually compare the fissure information that we can get from this protocol with this thermal fissure information which i think is a fair figure of merit uh, I'm not sure because you see, uh, normally when you go, because this thermal fish information sounds like classical fish information, right? So yes. when you move now from classical to quantum, you should have less information due to quantum fluctuations. 
But somehow you are saying, look, when I consider qubit, I can easily break this classical information. So this is a little bit strange to me. So something happened. I'm not saying uh, you, you should be perfectly correct, but just to me, it's a little bit surprising to me. Okay. Okay, but the uh, thing is, um, I, as in, I think it's, it's not guaranteed that your, any deficient information of a qubit must always be less than the one fissure information. That's not mm -hmm. what I, I'm saying. I'm just saying that let's assume now that you only have a qubit and you want to measure the temperature of the system. Uh, the temperature of the surroundings. So mm -hmm. in that case, you will put the system with the environment, right? Like for a layman, if I want to, eat, if I want to find the temperature of the system, I will put it with the environment. And once I couple it to the environment, the state will be a thermal state. So the mm -hmm. information that I get will be the thermal fissure information, the fissure information from a thermal state. Mm -hmm. Then I'm just comparing okay, if I have such a thermometer, a qubit thermometer, versus I do my protocol, what is the difference in the information? Okay, so now I ask my second question, which is much okay. more important. I okay. hope you noticed my paper with my postdoc, Zhang Dajian. Okay. Yes, I, I did. Uh, the one where you do, uh, you, you measure the position, right? Something no, measure, could it be parameter, could it be temperature, could it be anything okay. embedded okay, in the yes. mass equation. Yes. Okay, so yes. I, I'm very proud of that piece of work because we discover mm -hmm. if you consider weak coupling limit, right? Okay. Uh, uh, then of course system is assumed to be always restored to the equilibrium state governed by yes. the mass equation. Mm -hmm. And now if you consider weak coupling limit, we can break the quantum bound, okay? Uh, so in some sense, I can see some similarities because you also discovered in a weaker coupling case, uh, mm. your performance is better, right? Yes. Uh, and also you, you talked about some Zeno limit and so on. So it sounds like there is a connection between your discretized and uh, circuit version of the measurement scheme and uh, uh, my scheme, which is uh, based on continuous setup. So uh, okay. I think there are some more interesting connections to be, uh, uh, to be uh, looked into. Uh. Okay. So related to that, can you go to one of the slides where you compare FM versus uh, F theory? And uh, you plot this log plot uh, on the this one, one is it? Yes. So I'm a little confused why FM over F theory is 10 minus two. Uh, I'm just trying to ho hope to have more FM. Why it's 10 to minus two? I thought it should be 10 plus two. 10 plus 2? Yeah, Sorry. Well, why one axis, one y axis, it's a small number. When you say axis is a small number. Y axis. Y axis, okay. Yes. You said you have big in enhancement here, right? Oh yeah, uh, I have big enhancement as in collective enhancement, but each oscillator does not beat the thermal fissure information. So can you elaborate what's plotted? On the y axis, I'm totally the, y, the y axis is the um, fissure information met, um, by performing a measurement on n output on mm -hmm. over the thermal fissure information. It's not over one on it's over one thermal fission, uh, over a thermal qubit. So I use the same figure of merit. I'm saying if I have a weak interaction, so naturally if I have a weak interaction, I will not be able to gain much information from the system itself. So I don't really get, uh, I don't really learn much about the temperature. So if I compare F1 with the thermal fissure information, it's actually going to be small. But then I do get a collective advantage in the sense that if I measure Fn, I get, Fn is going to be much greater than n times of F1. But how do I see it's much greater? The ratio is only 10 minus 2 at most. A 10 to minus 2, okay. No, it's from 10 to the power of minus 3 point something to 10 to the power of minus 2, right? Maybe, maybe I should uh, uh, leave time for discussion with other people. I mean, I, I think here the Jambin, the comparison is between the straight lines and the dots uh, that are the individual measurements against the collective measurements. Uh, indeed, however, if you compare to the thermal feature information, in this case, you lose. I see. Okay. That's, I oh, think that's, that's okay. the point of this graph. So you spot okay. correctly that this number is correctly small. 
Okay. Uh, so at least my question was not totally wrong. No, no, uh, it's perfectly correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, now I, I give time to others uh, okay. to ask questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, we can discuss also face to face sometimes. We, some of us are here. I hope. Uh, yeah. I have a question in the chat uh, on whether uh, are there any physical implementations of this idea? Um, so there is a recent paper, uh, I should have put the link here, where um, they actually consider the use of um, core atoms to actually do this kind of interaction, the collective, uh, th this kind of like collision models. So I think that, that you can actually find um, papers that actually discuss how to implement this kind of like collision models. But in terms of um, coupling to the environment followed by um, an interaction, I think maybe this is a limitation um, based on the current like experiment, uh, experimental pro protocols that we can have, like to, to toggle between um, thermalization strokes and, inter and SA interactions. I can send a reference if someone is interested. Thank you. Uh... Any other questions? I don't have anything in the chat. I don't know if anybody wants to bring up other topics. Well, just a final comment. Uh, in my paper, we show that there's actually no limit. We can reach arbitrary precision in principle. Okay, yeah. So you can check okay. out our paper. Okay, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Questions or comments? Yes, uh, Xiang Shong Xu, uh, you can ask your question if you want. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, collision model, but um, not as a quantum thermometric setup, but more like a thermalization setup. Okay. Say that a ancilla that could um, uh, thermalize the, the system. Uh, so in most of the work I, I have seen, um, this interaction and the ancilla are chosen and they are fixed in the, in the sense that the ancilla and the identical copies and the interaction are always the same. Yes. I was uh, thinking um, if there's any work in that direction such that we have um, random interactions um, or small, uh, or some random matrix model to uh, model interacting finite quantum bars uh, with a collision model. Because uh, the first, yeah. Okay. yeah. The first you question is finish. that, uh, is even whether they will reach a steady state and uh, how does it relate to these uh, random interactions? Um, then the second, second is how does it relate to um, the, the, uh, the summarization, yeah. Okay, um, so, um, over here, um, let's say if you consider like, uh, let me go here. Okay, so if you consider like uh, energy exchange channel, you can actually show that um, you will always get that this, if you use a thermal probe, and then this term, if you use a thermal probe, then you will always get thermalization. So actually, um, you can actually look at, we have, we actually have one of a paper, uh, one paper on something similar where we discuss what happens, uh, where we discuss how you can actually write down a master equation for a repeated interaction, like this kind of collisional models, where in principle, you can introduce a uh, different um, oscillators or different interaction times between oscillators. So, so you can actually play with certain parameters like the interaction time between the auxiliaries or the interaction duration. So you can actually write down a master equation for that if your collisions are not uh, rapid. So in the sense that uh, if, if between successive auxiliaries you wait for a sufficiently long time, then you can actually write down a master equation for that. And in general, if you don't have any, uh, and in general, if you do like a sequential interaction, you can, it's really just a fixed map because you, you really just apply like, a, like a, a map as shown, hang on. So you can actually write down this kind of map if it's really just um, regular intervals. Okay, and with regards to thermalization, so um, people have suggested the use of collision models um, to mimic like thermalization, but what you can, uh, there is a paper by Philip Strasberg 
um, on P in PRX, I think published in 2017 or 20, 2018, where he actually discussed that um, you don't really get thermalization if the qubits are off resonance and you should actually include the the energy cost that comes in switching on and off the interaction. So in the case where the interaction between the system and auxiliary does not commute with the bare Hamiltonians, then you actually need to input or uh, remove work um, to switch on and off these interactions. And if you take into account all this, then um, you can make it into a thermodynamically consistent model. Yeah, so you can just check this reference out, or I can send you the references if you can find them. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, answer. Yeah, yes. um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of more questions, if anybody has. There doesn't seem to be any incoming question. Okay, very good. Then uh, if we finish with a question, then I, uh, we can uh, uh, thank Stella for the nice talk. And uh, uh, I hope you see you uh, live or again in Zoom for deep more talks of CQT. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye.